Hi, Steve Gilmore. This is the Gilmore Gang for Friday in some month of some year. I don't. I have no idea. It's February. That's great. Uh, I've been traveling too much, uh, so I, I'm kind of lost. Uh, Kevin Marks, you're you're still in uh, uh, undisclosed location where we were, just were, correct? I am indeed. Yes, I am in the middle of the desert, um, in a secret place. Yes. Excellent. Is it still 78 degrees? It's cooled off a little bit, but it's still nice. All right, well, that, that's the weather report from Kevin Marks. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, also from the British Isles. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not sure who I'm going to say first. I think I'll go with the New York guy. Uh, John Borthwick. Welcome, John. Hey, Steve. How are you doing? Uh, okay, I can't hear you. Okay. Uh, let me. I can hear you, John. Yeah, I can hear him, but it's. Just... I can hear you, John. Okay, good. Okay. That helps. The visual, eh, not so much, but. <laughs> you holding the mic up like that, I don't know if you're going to. But uh, we're going to make this a quick show because uh, John has a. a... Snowstorm. Oh, that's right. You have a, it, Are you in the I middle do, of I have a snowstorm. My whole schedule is getting messed up. So let's get, let's get going. <laughs> I, I should, may be able to stay longer or shorter. It's not clear. <laughs> oh, excellent. Uh, the other voice uh, that is uh, an English person is uh, is Keith Tier. Welcome, Keith. Welcome. I love it when my schedule gets messed up. I get free time then that I didn't expect. The best thing on earth is a snow day in New York. For the first hour, and then the slush comes, and then forget it, because <laughs> the slush turns to ice, and then the ice turns to very angry people. Uh, Danny Sullivan, welcome. Hello, thank you. Okay, we have hail here in Southern California. All hail the. We never get hail, so you see, it is a <laughs> weather system from coast to coast. Rule Fredonia. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Anybody want to start? Any, what's going on, John Borthwick, in, uh, in your corner of the world, uh, as, as you perceive it? Um, um, you know, a snowstorm. Um, what's, going on, what's going on otherwise? Um, gosh, we, we've had a busy week. Um, Dig is doing well, I hear. Dig is doing great, Danny. I'm really, um, I'm really happy with progress there. We've had... Um, whole bunch of um, new things going up there um, and we have uh, some new product which will be rolling out there in the next uh, sort of couple of weeks uh, so that's exciting um, we've been working hard on this um, uh, on this new uh, publishing app called tapestry which is doing very nicely and there's uh, Hugh McLeod, Gaping Void, put out some content this week, and then there's uh, a lovely story today about Mittens, which uh, is getting a whole bunch of readers. Uh, so that's going well. Um, and then we have a whole, you know, we have a whole set of uh, what we call hackers in residence who are here at BetaWorks, and uh, we've got eight eight teams running in parallel, and so. There's a couple of things that, you know, they only started uh, about a month ago, but there's a couple of things that have started to come out of that. So we have a, uh, a thing called Text Pals, which is really fun. Um, and, um, and then a, uh, a GIF search engine called Giphy, which is great. Uh, and so stuff is starting to come out there. Great. Um, where's your uh, camera, John? Where is my camera? Yeah. It's on top of the computer right. here. It, refer to it occasionally, all right? <laughs> <laughs> it is mounted on the I'm looking. <laughs> I'm looking down here, Steve, because I've got like, uh, shots coming in of, like, uh, of traffic and snow. So anyways. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> See, this, is, this is John's MySpace angle, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah so. uh, Kevin Marks, what's going on uh, from your perspective in the technology space? Well, I've been I've been not particularly on the web for the last few days, so I've I've been uh, missing th missing things. So I'm not sure. I, d I think the same things that are, that are going on that have been going on for a while, which is the sort of map transition to mobile going on, um, happening. The, the the stat that I liked this week was that somebody said that if you count tablets as PC. Uh, I think we're getting... Which presumably Microsoft now wants us to do now they've shipped a, a thing that looks like a tablet. Um, Apple is the biggest PC maker. Right. Am I gapping on you? 
Uh, yeah, you, the bandwidth is a little choppy. That's a cool data point, Kevin. <clears throat> hmm. Yeah, there's another data point in that is uh, Ed Bott, who is uh, a huge uh, Microsoft fanboy. I'm going to get in trouble for saying that, but not. Uh, he's uh, uh, he's talking well, not about fanboy. He's actually somebody who takes the time, I think, to go through and look at the stuff and, and really understands what's happening with Microsoft. Spoken like a fellow fanboy. <laughs> I, I, as I speak to you on my MacBook Retina. <laughs> I know, Danny. You've, you're, you're a very, uh, uh, what's the word? Oh, there's so many words. <laughs> It's got yeah, something to do with John imitation. Indian. It's got something to do with Indian mysticism, and uh, <laughs> you, you have a very Zen team, approach to being a Microsoft fan. Anyway, so I interrupted you. You're talking about um, Ed. Yeah. So he uh, there was a, evidently there was a, a lot of beating up going on about Surface Pro over its uh, space, uh, storage space, uh, and he compared it to the MacBook Air. Uh, in such a torturous way that <laughs> I forgot by the, the 20th paragraph what he was actually talking about. But it was apparently that they they both suck in terms of storage space was uh, was the <laughs> was the comment. Well, it was an interesting thing because I mean I have a MacBook Air. Uh, I had one of the 128s. And, right, that's um, the one he was comparing the uh, Surface. Yeah, and I don't with. even remember. I remember eventually running out of space, but I never tried to do much on it. I didn't try to use it as my main computer. And to me, the Surface Pro would be a similar thing. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be trying to store all my digital photo collection on that thing, right? I wouldn't be trying to use it in that way. I tend to use both my MacBook Air and my, um, you know, my tablets. They're, they're my easy ways to get to stuff that's on the cloud. As opposed to my MacBook Pro Retina, which is, you know, I paid for the 500 gigabyte, and I actually want to store stuff on there locally. So, you know, but I, I mean, I thought he did an interesting job trying to say, hey, look, okay, so you paid for 128 gigabytes, and it turned out that you only got, you know, 90. Guess what? The the MacBook, you know, the Mac Air is that way. I found the same thing happened with my uh, Yoga. It was a Windows 8 um, convertible tablet, right? And I was. I think I bought the 128 version, and when I looked at it, it was only like 80 gigabytes. And I had to go through, and I found, you know, on the support threads ways to, to bring it back up, so I got to around 100. And I certainly felt better about that. And I did feel a bit like, wow, you didn't really sell me 128 gigabytes of storage. You sold me a lot less. So, you know, but, but fair enough. It looked like he made that applicable all around. Well, I just thought that it was a kind of a... Uh, uh, the, it was a... Boy, I'm just losing words left and right here. But it was something that uh, uh, notable about the uh, inability of uh, Microsoft fans uh, to be able to find any silver lining anywhere with the possible exception of demeaning uh, other technologies, which, as you point out, are not built for uh, the job that you're talking about. With, with the a possible exception... Um with the possible exception of the Dell spin out where they put in two billion dollars and obviously hoping and praying that something good will happen. Well, I mean, Ed Bott's article actually just kind of made me interested in the idea of, uh, it was the first time that I thought about, oh, wait a minute, maybe the Surface Pro is an interesting way of actually having a PC. Does that, anybody follow that? No. I have no, re no use for a PC at this point. But if I did, that probably is the cheapest way to go. And that's basically what the point of the article was, was well, that it's a cheap PC. It's not a cheap PC. It's Compared not, to the so Air. It's not a cheap PC. You want a cheap PC? You can go buy a Windows 8 PC for like $600 and have a lot more than what Pro gives you. And it has touch? It is a, it is, and it's not even a cheap tablet because... Windows 8 does not work as a tablet. Windows 8 sucks as a tablet. Don't buy Windows 8 if you think you're going to be using that thing as a tablet. What it is is an expensive, weird, who knows what it is type of thing. So, you know, I know. That's, that's the problem with Surface and with the whole Windows 8 thing is that they don't, they're not tablets. And if you buy them and try to use them as tablets, You've spent a lot of money to get something that is nowhere near as good as an iPad or Android. 
even you if you can use it as a tablet for like two minutes until yeah. you get beyond the metro layer and then you're into old PC land. So, you know, I mean, it, it, it's just, but you know, on the flip side, you want to buy a nice $600 computer and experience how nice it is to actually touch your screen. Because once you've used Windows 8 and you start getting used to, you know, oh, I can tap my screen to do different things, that's kind of compelling. I'm sure we'll see that come to Apple eventually. But I, sometimes I've used the Windows 8 computer, then I go back to my MacBook, and I'm all like poking at it. <laughs> I was at a Best Buy the other day, and I was, showing, <laughs> I was showing the kids some of the Windows things, and I kept poking at the screens trying to make the Windows 8 computers go, and I thought, oh, this is stupid. They put them in... Uh, they locked them up, you know, you, they're, they're like in demo mode. And then I realized, no, I was actually trying to use Windows 8 computers that didn't have touch screens, so, yeah. <laughs> that's, what, that's what my six-year-old does with every screen he sees now. He touches yeah. it. Well, you know, this just, uh, basically, I'm just having a great deal of fun uh, watching you unwind not just the Surface, but also the entire Microsoft platform in, in your response to... Uh, to what I was <laughs> talking about. So, but, by you. the way, talking of Microsoft, did you notice that Yandex is now bigger than Bing as a search engine in the world? And what is Yandex? Oh, that's not, is I that the that. Chinese? It's, it's the, the Russian one. Oh. That's amazing. Uh, John Borthwick. Speaking of Facebook. John Borthwick, what do you think uh, is uh, uh, the... Are you prepared to... Uh, to call it on account of uh, snow uh, for Windows? <laughs> I mean, I think that, look, I, I think that Microsoft is, uh, um, you know, this, they're, they keep getting on the edge of really interesting plays, right? I mean, it's, uh, the, with the Connectics, they, there was something really interesting but didn't seem to quite follow through. Um, on on Bing, there were some interesting things that emerged, but it didn't seem to grab. Um, and I think on the you know, on the Surface, you know, version one of the Surface, I thought was, you know, the weakest part of it. I actually thought was the software. Um, and you know, when I played around it for a couple of days, it just I, I found the software to be um, just not very well made, which uh, kind of surprised me. Um, and coupled with the fact that you could like dig into it and get into like areas where it was almost like disappearing into another portal or another universe of um, you know previous versions of Windows. Um, so uh, now you know the new Pro um, is um, uh, this supposedly promised for that, but I think that they're going to uh, at some point time is going to run out for them. They've got an incredible legacy business and tail to their legacy business, but time is running out fast. And so I think they've got to figure out how they um, um, how they change that. Uh, you know, Skype. Uh, um, you know, the wonderful tool that we're using now. You know, really hasn't evolved much, right, since the acquisition. It's uh, and now it's going to become, you know, sort of as it sort of morphs into Windows messaging. It's just I I think it's going to become a less useful product. So I'm kind of expecting. I'm kind of like looking for somebody to replace that. So that's not a good sign, right? Well, that was the, the other news this week was WebRTC became real in that it now interoperates between um, Chrome and Firefox reliably. And that it means what? So Web, WebRTC is Web Real-Time Communications. It's the, it's the open standard for live video, um, video, audio, and text chat. And that's been, you know, there's, there, there's the usual, like, do we standardize on this or standardize on that battle going on? But um, we've got interrupt now between Firefox and Chrome, which means that those are the, you know two solid um, legs of the of the browser you know, quadrupod. Um, Microsoft is trying to push, still trying to push their own way of looking at it, which is different. But if they're going to do that, they're going to have to basically have to sh do what they they've been doing for the touch stuff and start shipping code into WebKit to, to get it to happen. I've I've got a, a friend actually who's the one of the is the main product guy at Skype here. And um, I had lunch with him recently, and I must say, Microsoft are giving them a lot of legroom. They they've got rid of uh, Messenger for them. They're not dictating that they've got to integrate with everything left, right, and center in Microsoft's ecosystem. They That's are good. pushing hard to try to get from synchronous to asynchronous messaging on mobile, so that they get more engagement. And if you noticed. Um, some of the upgrades recently, they're creating this new area called Skype Home, which is really bad right now. 
but they know they've got to move into that asynchronous messaging to get give people a reason to use Skype more than when they want to do a video call or a phone call. Tango is kind of in that world as well. And I, I wouldn't write Skype off just yet. I mean, s some of those people who were in the acquisition are fairly, um, there are kind of people and they're not demoralized yet. They feel like they're being given the space to, to implement. Well, that's encouraging. I mean, they've been doing good work on the Opus audio codec, which has been part of WebRTC. Um, that, that's a mixture of the, um, the Skype silk codec and the, um, what do you call them, the, the, the open source um, Vorbit screw, their speech one. Um, so that, that is um, being picked up by the standards group. So they're, you know, they're, they're, they're starting to contribute to this. We're having a little uh, uh, bandwidth issues with you, Kevin. We continue to. Uh, like you're, um, you're locked up, but now you're okay. Go ahead. Yeah, the, my bandwidth is, is uh, graph is a square wave. I'm sorry, I'm not sure. What, I'm not sure if I'm time sharing this hotel connection or something. Um, so the point is that a lot of these software infrastructure software is becoming open source, um, and what people are selling instead is services. Uh, and and um, you know, we've seen this ha this transition happen with Adobe, where they've stopped making Flash. They're starting to contribute to the browser, but still selling their tools. They let you build stuff on, on top of that. Um, and we, we're, we're starting to see this happen with the WebRTC stuff, where the basic technology gets pushed into the browsers and goes out to all the phones and tablets and things, as well as the computers. Um, and the, you know, the plug-in model doesn't exist on the, on, the, on the tablets and phones, so it has to be in the browser. But that means that you can still work out what, what it is that you're selling over the top. What are the, what's the... Inter As, I, I think, um, in a way, this call is a good evidence that yeah, what, you what, when you get into video and voice, <laughs> um, decentralization is still a challenge. Um, and Skype and Google, actually, in Hangouts, have very different architectures. If, if, you, if you ever use Google Hangouts, it actually works pretty well, even in bad network conditions, because they have centralized packet management. Whereas Skype, a lot of it is peer-to-peer -peer using uh, smart nodes. It's fairly decentralized. WebRTC is 100% decentralized. Yes. So I, I do think that the applications for which it's going to be good are not going to be the same as the applications that Google Hangouts or maybe even Skype is good for. But it'll be good for a lot of things. Okay. So I just want to point out that when I asked... Uh, Technology. And that's, that, that's been pretty impressive. They've been able to do multiple video streams collaborating fairly well there. So when I asked uh, Kevin uh, that we were having some uh, problems with his bandwidth, his response uh, in the chat room was, I'm having square wave shaped bandwidth graph problems, which is more <laughs> confusing to me than the bad audio. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? It sounds like a kid's show on TV, Bob well, square wave pants. I've got a little graph of available bandwidth here, and it goes like this. Yeah. <laughs> So it's 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 um, it keeps going dropping to zero for short periods and then coming back up again. Okay, well, but we're, I think a shut, a shut we're experiencing that. it that way as well. Yeah, at, at, at the, basically. The note that a. Kevin wrote in the chat, which is interesting to me, is that John Borthwick wrote a great State of the World essay to his shareholders, and I am he not totally a shareholder. I, I'm sad to say, but I'd well, love no, he, to he published uh, it for the hear rest more of about too. that. That that was that was a brilliant essay, John. Oh, thank you, John. You want to summarize it? Steve, you did not read it. Well, uh, I, <clears throat> I read it. Uh, I was, I did, it was, it I was, was long. So I received so, it as um, part I, of the. Uh, I tried to um, put together. A, I I tried to. I do put together a shareholders ladder every year for BetaWorks shareholders, and and last year it ended up um, on Pando Daily, and so this year, um, the people at Pando. Um, ping me and asked me if I was going to do it again, and so I, I said yes, and uh, so we published it, or I gave it to them on Pando, and also um, Gigawan people um, were looking for it, so um, so I gave them a copy of it. It's, so what this is, is it's a sort of state of things from our perspective at Betaworks, and um, over the holidays, you know, I sit down for a couple of days and sort of put my thoughts down, and um, uh, this time about 17 pages came out, and then one of my colleagues here at uh, Betaworks, um, Andrew McLaughlin, said, I'll take a whack at editing it down. And 
came back from him and it was 25 pages. Um, <laughs> and while he was editing, I was still writing. So uh, <laughs> there were another 10 pages. So it ended up around 30. So we did edit it some, but we didn't have time to edit it. So down the answer to you. What did it do? It, we sort of covered, uh, we covered a lot of things in it, Steve, which are things we've talked about on these calls um, you know, repeatedly, everything from platform wars to sort of the the rise of the notification interface to uh, you know something that's very near and dear to Robert's uh, heart uh, the contextual computing and these sort of emerging sort of contextual data space and how that changes um, devices and navigation and so on and so forth so it covers uh, all of that stuff and some are you uh, optimistic so that's a quick summary are you optimistic I you know I Am I optimistic? I mean, I think that um, I don't, the little that I did, was. the little that I did skim of it. Uh, I think that we're. I think that we are. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm optimistic. I'm a perennial optimist, but I, I see that we've we have um, a even on the platform war stuff. You know, it is. It is. It, it, you can you can make a very solid linear argument that any one particular player is both acting rationally and will get to a good outcome. And then you can suddenly hit a wall and say, oh, shit, what about this, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, Google, I think, did a, you know, an incredible job last year of navigating through sort of the, you know, the mostly openness of Android and scaling out that platform of, you know, putting their apps uh, or their single services as apps onto iOS and sort of, you know, mitigating some of Apple's position, if not getting right in there on iOS uh, with their core apps. Um, and, and so so you could, you know, end that argument by saying, well, Google's, you know, Google's going to win. I think that then you tile on top of that a um, the reality that, uh, you know, Samsung could end up um, commoditizing the OS and, uh, you know, can, you could play out a narrative that Samsung could win that game. Uh, you could also play out a narrative, obviously, on the social side where, you know, Google Plus, I think, has, um, has not succeeded yet. Um, and so that there's a social flank that's open still for them. And so, you know, any of the major players, I think, uh, many of them have many open flanks, but all of them have some open flanks. And so, you know, what does that say? That says, you know, I'm optimistic that we're going to see a lot of innovation. I'm optimistic. I believe that we're going to see a ton of change. I mean, this, I know for sure that by this time next year, there will be massive pieces of the puzzle that we didn't expect to move will have moved. Um, and I think that the, you know, the combination of the transition to mobile, the transition to touch, the transition to contextual, you know, sort of computing and what that means for everything from interfaces to just how we do stuff is, you know, it's, it, it's, it's changing all of this. And so everything from media to storytelling is changing and changing radically. And even the weather's changing here. John, I'm interested in, you, you, uh, Pando makes the point that you're moving from a spin out of companies and getting them funded as separate entities to more investing in Betaworks itself. And that kind of crosses over with, I, I, uh, you know, I'm doing a startup and we've raised uh, about 2.7 million and I'm now thinking about raising money and every, all my investors are telling me about the uh, Series A crunch. I just wonder if you can put into context your thinking about what you're going to do with what's going on more broadly out there where it seems to be a hit driven business with VCs waiting on the sidelines until there's you know a number five hit in the charts and then they try and pile in and everything else gets discarded. How do you yeah, think I mean, of all of that? I, I think so, Keith, I, I think I got the thread. I lost you. You broke up a little bit at the beginning. But I heard the end, so let me try and answer it, and if I don't, then correct me. So, um, so I sort of laid out this perspective, which is somewhat contrarian, is that uh, there's, you know, I think that the, the Series A crunch, which I think is, is it's clearly happening, it's clearly there are, there's a narrowing of the funnel there's a, uh, at the Series A. The Series A crunch, though, I think is a symptom of a changing marketplace. And that changing marketplace has a couple of new dynamics. The first is, is that there is a separation at the bottom of the stack. So in other words, the seed layer is finding ways to both get seed funding from, th from entities that are separate and distinct from VC, and also the seed layer is finding ways to monetize and not need VC. 
And so you can find you know, small examples of that everywhere, and then you can find some really big examples. Most of them are in gaming, you know, whether you know, uh, you know, Angry Birds, Clash of Clans, you know, a lot of these gaming companies that get to huge scale uh, fairly quickly. Many of them don't take VC money until later, if ever. But right? isn't so that got isn't that you know monetization through iOS and through App Store? But you also have these novel uh, funding platforms like um, like Kickstarter uh, that are driving. Um, you know, money into the system in a whole different way too. But so what's the result is, is that yes, there is a, you know, there's an, an ex I think the more interesting thing is the explosion of the seed layer than looking at the, you know, the, the I, I, I wish that, I, I want to focus on that explosion because I think that's the more interesting phenomenon. The fact that the, the Series A crunch, it isn't actually a crunch because if you look at the data, uh, CB Insights data is pretty good on this, is that the VCs are funding the same number of seed companies as they were given the scale. And so that stayed consistent, so the VCs are still doing what they do. What's happened is the massive amount at the bottom. Now, I don't want to hide the punchline that there will be more things that die, right? I mean, it's, it, is, it is becoming more Darwinian or hit-based at some level, yes. But I think that a lot of people running away from consumer, I think, is, I see that as an opportunity for a lot of these new funding systems to uh, engage in consumer because consumer innovation ain't done. A couple and of questions. So, um, a couple I of questions. Yes, yeah, Steve. Yeah. Uh, one, isn't this, uh, you know, all an example of how the cloud has, uh, has changed, uh, you know, funding of new uh, development? I mean, isn't that a larger meme than just the gamers uh, being able to come in with, uh, you know, uh, with yep. low cost? I mean, it's, you know, obviously Amazon, uh, Rackspace, et cetera, but also uh, the ability for uh, companies to be able to try out things. And then if they hit to be massively scalable uh, immediately through outsourcing. Correct. Yeah. You mean to virtualize all pieces of the, or many pieces of the, of the business creation process? Yeah, well, I think that virtualizing of business creation is, a, is a, an interesting phrase, uh, which is where, uh, where it's going. I don't think that it started as a business model. It, it started as, a, uh, as what you said, you know, virtualizing of, of uh, resources, but it's quickly changed into where's the value add for being able to uh, find an audience and then be able to pivot from that audience to a much larger one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Danny, uh, let me ask you, what do you see as the, uh, uh, the impact of, uh, this kind of funding pattern on, uh, Google's, uh, chances? Uh, do you see them as being impacted, uh, competitively by any of these uh, new startups? I, I only caught about half of all this cause I was, I was cutting in and out. I had to redial in back and forth, so I'm, I apologize for that. That's all right. I'm just um, generally saying or asking whether the the predictions of uh, a difference in funding patterns uh, uh, and the elasticity of funding that is now going on in the uh, startup space as a result of the cloud, whether that's having an impact on, uh, is that a competitive threat to uh, uh, Google? You know, it's hard for me to say. I, I don't really spend much time on the startup space and who's getting funding and who's not getting funding. Um, being out of it, a lot of the times, <laughs> being out of it, a lot of the times, I look at all the funding stuff as, as kind of a mess anyway. I, I see people get excited about one company getting funding as if that is somehow uh, validating that the company is actually worthwhile or not. When I, you know. I run a startup and we've never taken funding. So when I try to figure out how we're doing, it's because of the fact that we actually haven't had to take funding. Um, so, <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and I think there's more and more people like you, Danny. And I think that's a good thing right? because we're building a more sustainable uh, but, ecosystem. I mean, but, I think that you this, get, but, you know, the, the, companies... the VC model, wonderful as it is, is to just assumes that everything has to go to massive scale. And it's, you know, it's constructed for these for massive hits, and that's that makes sense for the way that they are funded. In other right. words, it's like that's their business model. But in order to build a sustainable ecosystem of um, of big 
middle and and even smallish uh, uh, businesses on the internet, we're going to have to uh, they're going to have to be funded up and down that stack. Right, yeah. and I. It's funny. I I was a big SimCity fan. I guess SimCity is making a comeback. But I, I always go back to think about how when I used to play SimCity, you could put in your cheat code, and you know, you well, you play SimCity, you start out with twenty thousand dollars, and you, you could build some things, but really, you had to build your city up over time, where you had enough income coming in that you could expand. Uh, but if you had a cheat code, you know, you would type in the word funds, you could get yourself up to like having a hundred thousand dollars, and I used to do that for a while. And then I would build everything, right? Power plants, everything I wanted was all out there. And my cities were never that healthy because they started out with all this funding, if you will, and they didn't actually have the infrastructure. And they had all the infrastructure, but they didn't actually have the people living in the city to support them. So I always like the idea that you've kind of built up and, and grown with it. Now, can now other people hear Danny? I can't. What's up? I can I, hear. I lost you. Oh, it was it was. Pearls of knowledge. <laughs> I, no, I love the SimCity analogy. I just, I, well, I told totally What I was saying was, when, when, you would, when you would play SimCity, there was a way for you to use a cheat code to get a lot more money all at the very beginning. Yeah. And when I would do that, and I would build out my city infrastructure, my cities never seemed to be as healthy or grow as well as the cities that just organically grew off of the tax base as people started to moving in. And I've always kind of thought of that in the way of businesses that you can get a big huge influx of money and you can build out all the stuff you want but then it may be that you're not actually as healthy as a business that has actually built its own individual revenue and, and grown yep. up to match that now clearly clearly for some businesses that's not going to make sense and in this kind of hyperactive market we have in the tech world you know getting in the tech funding you know not not everybody can kind of do that not things are saying things just wouldn't happen if you didn't have funding so yeah but, but I, I just I, I think I, I think just always look at funding what? and I just kind of think gosh I I wish that there was more attention on why is that company getting more money because do they really need more money right now? Shouldn't they not need more money right now? Wouldn't Wouldn't it be nice if we were, you know, highlighting that? <laughs> I, I, but I, th I I do think that um, what you said, Danny, applies to products as well. Some products organically uh, find their audience and grow naturally. Uh, others need marketing, and whenever they need marketing with a capital M, you kind of fear that there's something not real there. So I, can't, I, I do completely empathize with what you're saying. I also think that some things take a while. You know, if you've got 15 people on payroll because that's how many engineers you need to attack the problem, you've got a cost which is way ahead of any revenue potential and someone can see the opportunity and fund that and make a lot of money by being a shareholder. There's, there's nothing... Not only is there not nothing wrong with that, that that's an essential part of innovation against right. big objectives. And there's, the world's big enough for both of those. Right. Oh, yeah. I, I think that Danny's analogy is great, Keith, because I think that if used as a blunt instrument, if used, if used as it's meant to be, it's an incredibly powerful, useful thing. But if it's used as a blunt instrument, like any blunt instrument, it can sometimes be misused and have unintended consequences. Yeah. I think that what uh, the thing that I found interesting that we haven't really uh, teased out is the is what John said about uh, the sort of the middle of the market. You know, it, there's a lot of it's very bursty. There's a lot at the, at the sort of home run. Let's you know go for the home run. Uh, you know, with a small startup, and then there's the um, you know the big players and the uh, you know. IPO market and all of the stuff at the high end and in the middle is where this is going to have to be real. Uh, do you want to address uh, what you think, John, is going to happen in the middle? Well, I would say, okay, so there's two actual areas that I think are really interesting. One is the middle, Steve, and the other ones is the sort of the high frequency stuff. In other words, the stuff that gets to huge scale. But then sort of, you know, is you may call it fatty, um, comes down again. Right, and so because as Danny described, it's uh, was as Keith outlined is that the the traditional funding model sort of predicates or, or suggests that you could get to huge scale and then you just keep going up, right? And so so I think that for the hit based stuff, you know, studio like structures seem to work pretty well, right? They work in uh, they work for, uh, they work for years for, in the music, they work in film, 
and I think that they work pretty well. And that is a, an environment where there's essentially a, uh, some, a certain amount of platform stuff. In other words, there's a certain amount of shared resources. You know, maybe the studio does marketing, it does maybe data, maybe analytics as shared resources. And then there's things that get built on top of that. Um, Zinc has essentially structured itself somewhat like that. Um, Electronic Arts is structured exactly like that. Uh, quite a few of the gaming companies have you know, done that. So that sort of works pretty well for the hit-based stuff. Um, the, the, going, your question, the stuff in the middle, I think that, you know, taking venture funding, um, you know, in, in, in careful doses um, can be a great way to, you know, build out the middle. Um, they, the trick is, though, is that you have to, at some point, figure out how you're going to, let's say that you build up a successful business like Danny has, but you've taken a bit of venture funding, you do have to figure out how they get out because those guys have a business model themselves and they have a time window, you know, call it seven, eight years, where they need to see you know, their capital come out. And so what I've seen people do is, is that, you know, either dividend or give, you know, money back um, and, uh, and or uh, give opportunities to buy out um, those investors uh, for companies in the middle. Um, and so, you know, those things, those things have worked, buy them out or even have other investors with more patient capital come in. Um, so, yeah, I think that those solutions and those systems and, 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 and funding sources that are emerging all over this map, right? So the secondary market, which became sort of, you know, much more heated and lost, you know, sort of goes up and down a bit with regulation and also with different players. But clearly the run-up towards the Facebook IPO drove, drove a lot of activity in the secondary market for Facebook and for a lot of other stocks. There's, and there's that also, helps them support um, also some of the switching founder. out of capital, right, oh, where sorry. certain investors could leave and other ones could come in who had a different profile and a different ability to fund um, for longer periods of time, et cetera, et cetera. Keith, go ahead. I was going to say the other thing is the founder. I, I, I met yesterday with uh, Simone uh, uh, from AppGratis. And AppGratis is very like Danny. He's built a business with no... From investment. which business, Keith? I think they do about $10 million a year in revenue now. And um, they have about 100 million downloads of their app and 10 million live installs. Um, and, um, you know, if you... It, it, the, the problem for him is he can't take any money off the table. And so he recently took an investment, not because his company needed it, but it was a way for him to put some money in the bank, buy a house, and that kind of stuff. Sorry, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. We just don't have anything to say. A anyway, so, you know, let's say Danny wanted to, you know, put two or three million dollars in the bank. There's probably a way for him to do it if that's not attractive to him. And, and some investors would help him do that. Others... Um, Others, his model wouldn't be attractive because it'd be too small for them. And I think John's right. There's money at every part of the ecosystem. You've just got to right-size your company and your funding strategy to what you want to achieve. All right, I want to switch gears uh, for a second, uh, or half a second, depending upon how long John has, uh, to something which none of you will have an opinion about, but I find fascinating, which is uh, Netflix's release of House of Cards. Has anybody I, seen any I, of it? I think it's fascinating too, Steve. Danny, have you seen any of it? No, I got to watch it because I kept seeing all this stuff about House of Cards and I tweeted that I was getting confused because I kept reading it as Game of Thrones. <laughs> I don't know why. It's I the new... It's feeling, I, I guess I'm feeling antsy, but I thought, oh yeah, okay, I better go check it out. It sounds like a lot of people are excited about the series and I could use a good new series. I just finished catching up with all of Parks and Rec on, on Netflix. So, uh, yeah. Okay, well, uh, you know, it, it's something that I believe is on your fabulous Roku box. So yeah. you do have access to it. I still need to send you one of those, but yeah. Yeah. I'll go upstairs and wait by the door. Yeah. Do they have Netflix on the... On the uh, they have Netflix on my refrigerator at this point. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, I, I haven't seen it, but I did read that they their goal is to become... You know HBO that they want to become a, a quality production shop, and well, you've got to admit that if you look at some of the stuff that's come out of the quality production shops recently, uh, really ever since The Wire or Friday Night Lights, uh, Damages, 
there's the, this whole string of shows that are just awesome that, that you really want to watch the next one. If, if, they can, if they can produce high quality stuff, there is an audience now for that. And there's no reason why a distributor can't also be a producer. Right. Well, I think the the uh, you know the comparison to HBO is is largely a kind of a you know winner take all scenario that's being uh, baited by the media. But uh, what I think, I mean, if you compare it to what the quality of Showtime series, uh, which is a more apt comparison, uh, there they've already lapped uh, Showtime. I mean, Home Homeland uh, was the first time that Showtime really had a uh, you know, an oar in the water in terms of going after HBO's ultimate model, and they're they're being very successful with it, but it's just an early stage, and uh, and House of Cards has got the same level of quality. In, in fact, I think it's better uh, in terms of uh, production value. But what I find really fascinating about this is uh, that they've dumped it on the market. Yeah. In one in one batch, right? Yeah, thirteen episodes, uh, and they're filming the next batch. And there was an interesting statistic uh, uh, in a New York Times article uh, where they uh, uh, were asking uh, they were the the other networks were complaining that Nielsen was not evaluating it in terms of the ratings, uh, and Nielsen came out and said basically the reason they're not touching is because there's no advertising involved right which is a reasonable statement well and also because nielsen doesn't know how to rate television shows but you know let's just continue on with that fiction right they don't know how to rate television shows and they <laughs> let's not no poke at the fiction of television IE, right? ratings they've got, you know on your roku box they have no access to that so they're they're just i mean their technology is broken for that well, their business model is broken for it, and that's yeah. what I find fascinating about this is that it's just uh, it's it's a virus that's going to uh, well, well, it's, spread it's everywhere. Television's business model is broken. That's that's the thing. The, the the model of TV advertising is broken, and it's going to collapse this year. And they were only kept alive last year because of the U.S. election injecting billions of dollars into 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 the, the TV stations. But I think Netflix here are saying. We are seeing this pattern. People are watching entire series in chunks like this. You know, currently we're mainlining the Tudors, which there's four series of, and you watch three episodes of that a night, and you know, it's it's good fun stuff. But it is, it is a new visual medium. It is long form television enjoyed in long in long chunks. Um, yes, and, right. and it breaks down. I mean, it, it breaks down. I find it fascinating because it breaks down the assumption that, you know, scarcity will drive, uh, you know, sort of more devoted viewership, right? And so um, that that's sort of been tried and true formula um, uh, with media and with distribution for a long time. And here you have an open funnel in, you know, I mean, I think it started actually, there were aspects of this appeared with DVD, um, but Netflix going all the way, um, I think is a it's it's it, it's it's radically disruptive to a whole bunch of people's business models. Um, people aren't used to committing to shows that way. In other words, funding them. So it goes back to the funding question in a big and fundamental way. But this time for content, the people aren't used to uh, being able to carry them in that way. You know, non-IP based providers. I mean, they could do it over uh, on demand, but it's 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 a whole different method of delivery for them. So distribution changes, and I think it, it's uh, it makes the game really interesting. You know, I mean, the thing is, it's also the natural way. If, if you actually look at you know look at BitTorrent as well, how would people consume this if they didn't have to deal with this bullshit? Um, if you look at what BitTorrent has for things, it is they will have current episodes, or they will have entire season downloads because that's the natural unit of watching watching a popular series. Um, and Netflix is, you know, has the stats to back this up, and they know that's how people use it. Use it. And so you, you, you hear about this cool thing, Breaking Bad, and you sit there and watch you know, three seasons of it on Netflix, and then you go, and, um, go, to, go to BitTorrent or the DVDs to get the current season. And so there's, there's this, you know, they, they have got, unlike, you know, unlike Nielsen, they've got actually who's watching what, when, and when did they stop watching, and what time of day did they do it, and exactly where did they pause it and go to the bathroom, because they have that for every customer, because that's, that's the way their system works. Mm -hmm. So they can, rather than, rather than the sort of ridiculous guesswork that Nielsen uses, they, they've got real statistics, and, they, and the answer is people are watching whole series. Right. Well, the thing that I find fascinating is 
the the movie. So business. Steve. Yes, go ahead. I'm afraid I have to jump off. All right. Well, we got out. we got a lot out of you. Finally arrives. Right. Okay. Well, thank you. We got a lot out of you in a short time. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. This is ha fun stuff. Bye. Have fun. Take care. See you, John. Take care. Bye. So what I find fascinating is that the the movie business and the television business have effectively merged uh, as a result of this uh, innovation, because what Netflix is doing is buying, uh, you know, 13 weeks. Uh, however long it's consumed by the entire audience is irrelevant. After you're done with that series, then you'll move on. They'll release the next Breaking Bad chunk. After that is done, they'll release, you know, it's a, it's a window. Well, their, only, their only problem is, you know, their only problem is that all presumes that they get the deals to run all that stuff, right? I mean, to go back, we spent the past month watching all the Parks and Rec on Netflix up until the current season. Then we had to shift over to Hulu and we endured the 100 million ads that they wanted to shove at us over and over again. Actually, there weren't that many ads. They yeah, were just the same ad 100 million times. Yeah. The same ad 100 million times, exactly. Um, you know, despite being, I mean, I, here I am like, gosh, if you're going to show me the ads, could you not change it up a bit, right? And then actually it propelled us to last night for the first time actually watching it live. Well, DVR'd, right? <laughs> You know, but we were, you know, it's it's put us into that series in a way we hadn't done before. But, you know, if you're network television, you really feel like Hulu is that much of a threat to you, or not Hulu, but um, Netflix, you, you cut them off from your content. And that's a big challenge for Netflix then, because, you know, there's only so many crappy movies I want to watch on Netflix. And there's a lot but, of crappy movies. Is, yeah. is there a few, is, does this uh, indicate a future where... If you think about it, Netflix and um, Hulu are just aggregators. Why doesn't the producer of the content, the production company, um, put it straight on Apple TV and Roku and cut out even Netflix in the middle? I well, mean, I think it's, what role does Netflix really play that you need anymore? They, they could do that, but you know, I don't know if you remember when we had the, the rumble in the jungle or whatever it was between... Um, uh, John Stewart and um, Bill O'Reilly. They had their online debate, and that was a fiasco trying to sign up for that thing. You know, it, it is probably easier if you're a producer and you're used to working with a network, my guess is from afar, to, to work with a network that wants to buy you and give you all that security and not have to do it. I'm sure there'll be entrepreneurial people who could do that, but, you know, if you're producing content, it's nice to be able to put your content out on a channel with a lot of viewers. And that, I think, is the metamorphosis that Netflix is going through, that, hey, we are a channel, and we have stuff that's out there. And you know, the, the question is, do they get this balance enough where they can build up enough of their original content that perhaps they insulate themselves from the other production houses saying, you know, we're going to take all the content away. Because you might say, you know what, I am going to produce this, and I'm going to sell it to NBC, but I'm going to sell NBC first run rights, and I'm going to sell it off to Netflix. Yeah, but, you know, I money there. I mean, you're, you're exactly right about what the implications are for the competitive networks, but, uh, you know, like NBC, for example, they've got a tremendous uh, chasm in place that they are going to have a hard time leaping over, uh, you know, which is their existing uh, model. They 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 can't do this in the same way that Microsoft can't really go to the cloud as fast enough to be able to destroy all their margins. They have an existing model with stars. Uh, the idea of you know keeping people uh, you know sort of locked in to their release schedule so that they can intermix it with the, with the profit centers of the network, which are the Today Show and the Tonight Show and things like that, which are live, uh, you know, guest shows playing off these same shows. In other words, they do the shows, then uh, the stars go around to all the talk shows and promote those shows live, which they do maintain control over. So that's a, a model that they have to keep, that they have to persist. They can't compete this way. I mean, they've already basically sacrificed uh, the notion of seasons, you know, February sweeps. Right. Uh, you know, all that stuff's gone. Uh, well, they, they, can, they can try to do that if they want that way, or they can shift. I mean, House of Cards, all I know about House of Cards, I know off of what was in Twitter. 
I didn't watch any promos for it. If I went back in the Netflix to go watch something else, I probably would have seen a promo there, but I haven't been in there since it launched. I didn't watch any talk shows where this was going on, and yet here's a television show I want to tune into solely because I've gotten word of mouth through the Internet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and not only that, but you have innumerable devices with which to be able to tune in. I mean, every device you have can play this thing. Uh, yes, it's true. Yeah, and that's astounding. So what I'm trying to point out about the uh, opportunity for Netflix, I don't, uh, to Keith's point, I do not think that Netflix is going to be, uh, uh, you know, disintermediated here, I, I, you know, or whatever the correct word is, the, because uh, a couple of reasons. First of all, they have 28 million subscribers. So to Danny's point, you know, they're becoming a channel. No, they're, they have more viewers than Showtime does. And they're closing in on HBO in terms of numbers. I mean, I, they'll, they'll never get there. It'll always be a, you know, receding horizon line. But the, the, their ability to be able to uh, fund these things is already built in. And they don't have to win 52 weeks a year. If they win 13 weeks a year, or, you know, if you divide the market up into Breaking Bad, Mad Men, uh, Hometown, or Homeland, Homeland. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, one or two of the network shows, which are increasingly being, I mean, we stopped watching, uh, what, what's the thing, Grease, or the, the kids show? Uh, uh, Glee. Glee. We stopped watching Glee, and you know, I, I finally just deleted it all all the DVR recordings, you know, thinking, well, I'll just wait for six months or whatever it is when it comes up on Netflix. If we decide that we want to get into it, we can do it in a weekend. So you know, everybody's going to move to this uh, sort of you know series, long form, all available on demand uh, at your leisure on all devices model. And but that that it, but what that implies is that um, let let's say you the guy who makes Breaking Bad, you you are going to want to put it everywhere. You're going to want to put it. Uh, the only thing you can't do is put it out directly uh, to the audience on the Roku or the Apple TV because you you've signed contracts to give it to Netflix, to give it to Apple TV, and and so it's everywhere uh, except doing it yourself. And but I, Netflix you know, is you look everywhere. at in the book business where soft publishing is beginning to happen. I just wonder whether some of the bigger production companies like DreamWorks, uh, the, the really big guys, <clears throat> can't actually become their own distribution networks as well, and then cut out the middleman, and more of the money's there. But the, but you know H, they have to fight H, off HBO. I mean, they're paying HBO tremendous amounts, or HBO is paying them tremendous amounts for their feature film libraries. Yeah, they're so not there's gonna, a cannibalization issue. Right, they're not going to screw with with HBO. That's the innovator's dilemma. I mean, the the upside's much bigger if you screw up your short term. I'm not sure I understand what you just said. I'm saying there's more money long term in not doing those deals, but you make a huge sacrifice short term. Take CNN. CNN makes six hundred million dollars from advertising and gets eight hundred million from cable subscription fees. If they, if they, uh, their costs per year to run the business are eight hundred million dollars. So if they cancel their cable contracts, there'd be two hundred million dollars in the hole. But if they cancel their cable contracts, my guess is they could do free to internet, and their advertising revenues would more than double. But they'll never do it because they're scared to lose the eight hundred million they get from cable. Right. Well, I think the other fundamental thing about this is that this is the closest thing to magic that I've ever seen. I mean, you know, when the when the show starts on Netflix, this House of Cards thing, it, it just says, uh, you know, the title sort of scrolls across the page saying Netflix. I'm looking at something which is indistinguishable from any other source. You know, all these networks with all of their power and all of their, you know, station, uh, you know, network-owned stations, etc. They can't compete with this guy. You know, this thing is just coming up. Uh, in real time, and it, it, it's available on my phone, it's available on my iPad mini, it's available on the big screen. There's no quality difference. And what they've succeeded in doing with this particular show is they've gotten a world-class actor who uh, 
is essentially doing, you know, uh, what was it, uh, Henry the Eighth, or what? he's doing some sort of uh, Richard the Third, maybe. Uh, he's doing some sort of, you know, the asides to the camera for those of you who uh, have seen any of the shows uh, are he. This guy knows what he's doing in the theater, and he knows what he's doing on television, and he does great Johnny Carson impressions when he goes on Letterman. So he's got he's got the advantages of all of the big time network strategies, and it's coming to you in a in a in a system and in a form where you feel like you're actually in control of your TV for the first time. So uh, I think that that just the emotional connection that Netflix brings is really extraordinary, and I think that they're going to ride it all the way to the bank. Any other comments on this? I think you're on the money. You're right. Even Danny seems to agree. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's. I mean, I think it's all hard to predict. Really? Yeah. Of course, it's hard to predict. Why? Well, what's hard about it? I don't understand. I think it's obvious what what's happening. Don't that, you? That I things you are do. shifting online, and that that producers may go directly to some of the online. No, I don't. I don't I agree that producers are going to go direct because right. they have all these relationships that they can't undermine. It's a oh. it's a margin problem, and they're not going to be able to do it. Yeah, potentially. Okay. So you think that the rich are going to get richer, and uh, and these disruptive elements? Uh, I mean, to me, I think that, at some go point, ahead. I think at some point, if you really are a savvy broadcaster, you buy Netflix, right? Or you, you know, perhaps you come together, and I think it starts to get tricky. Like, for example, when you have the multiple networks on Hulu coming together, and if they all agree that their content can't go out to somebody else. Um, does that potentially have antitrust types of things? Because, you know, you're given the ability to have broadcast networks and the public trust, right? And so if you put your television shows out there and then you don't let those television shows out in other ways, I, I don't know. It, it'll be interesting. That's what I mean where it gets tricky and it'll be interesting to see how it all kind of kind of flows out. It, there's got to be disruption, clearly. What surprises me, though, is that the television networks have taken so so long to adjust and figure things out and, and decide where they want to go and what they're going to be doing and yeah. You know. Well, the th I mean, the thing is, they've they've also got a bunch of people who are trying to pay the money for for streaming now. They've got Amazon, they've got Apple, they've got Google, and they've got Netflix, who are all trying to um, flesh out their library of stuff to stream, which means that they they're, they're probably feeling comfortable about this, and that that may be a good thing. That may stop them doing some of the more Kamikaze things like trying to block the networks that they that they were threatened to do before with Netflix. Well, no, but I mean, but they haven't stopped blocking Google, like on Google TV. I mean, they obviously have an agreement with with um, with. Uh, uh, but, but, Netflix, go, but, go, but Google Play on the on the tablets has got a reasonable range of stuff. Oh yeah, yeah it's not quite as rich as Amazon's, but it's pretty good. Uh, I think Netflix is going to pull away. Uh, Kevin has to go, so I'm going to wrap this one up. So, uh, starting with uh, Kevin, uh, just give us a summary of, uh, of you know, your parting thoughts. Running thoughts. Well, my my my, my roundup this week is um, Apple is the top computer manufacturer because we're counting tablets, but that's that's about to change because the the Android is coming, and um, the the TV advertising business is going to vanish, but the TV companies will be fine. Keith? Uh, I don't agree that Android is coming to threaten Apple. I think Apple is going to stay the biggest by a long way. Um, but I love Android. I, I have some and I play with it. I just think Apple's better. Um, I think that John has uh, nailed it with his contrarianness. I do believe consumer is going to be massive, much bigger than enterprise in the short term because of mobile. And John's probably going to do very well with his strategy. Danny. Um, Facebook broke the internet yesterday, and that was fun. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was funny, yes. Did they <laughs> fix it? it? They fixed it after about 15 or 20 minutes, but it was interesting to watch how having Facebook plugins on your website caused your website not to be available to people. Um, that probably deserves a lot more reflection than it really got. But um, 
that was interesting. And um, there was some other big news that happened this week that I thought was a big deal. Now I can't remember. Well, you'll Should remember have. as soon as we get off. Yeah, it'll all come <laughs> back to me with it there. The whole Google... Uh, my, it was interesting to see Microsoft is launching this negative attack campaign against Gmail. And they they clearly decided that, you know, I guess they have this political consultant that's telling them, you got to go negative on Google. you got to go negative on Google. If you can whip up the privacy stuff, that's going to kill them. And I don't think it will. I, I do think that maybe having a good product might. But... <laughs> might kill them? Yeah. <laughs> well, not kill them, but I mean, I think... Having a really good product is probably going to do a better job than um, trying to attack Google over privacy things that people say they're concerned about when you ask them in the right way, but in reality they're not that bothered. Yeah, I think that. So it's it's, it's interesting to see them think that they're fighting a political campaign to win consumers because I don't know that consumers are necessarily looking at products that they buy as they in the same way that they look at politics. No, they they don't care. They just want to know if it works on their uh, iPad. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Uh, I agree with everything that everybody said, including uh, the contrarian parts. I, 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 however, I think that uh, uh, what's going to happen on the, in the enterprise as a result of mobile uh, achieving supremacy is going to be uh, amazing and it's going to happen very quickly. So I don't see it as a choice between consumer and uh, enterprise. I think the two are connected by us, the users. Yeah. All right, this is Steve Gilmore. This has been the Gilmore Gang. Uh, uh, shout out to uh, John Tashak, who's uh, in New York, uh, and his family uh, for uh, our condolences and best wishes uh, to uh, his wife, Linda, and her family. Uh, I want to thank, uh, uh, well, I'd like to thank Rackspace, and particularly Rob Jess and Robert Scoble, who well, he couldn't make it today, came up and was represented in the conversation. So thanks, Robert Scoble. <laughs> I want to thank uh, John Borthwick, uh, who's out tramping in the, in the mud. And uh, uh, I want to thank Keith Tier. Thank you, Keith. You're welcome. Uh, Kevin Marks, who's uh, leaving the undisclosed location on the way to uh, back to San Francisco, I hope. And uh, Danny, uh, enjoy uh, Los Angeles and all of its uh, its glory. All right. Thank you. We've got a manhunt going on. Oh God! It's, well, no comment. Um, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it's frightening. Uh, I want to thank our producer and director, director Tina, Tina Chase Gilmore. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank uh, the chat room, which was lively today. Uh, Keep up the good work. Uh, and I want to thank everybody who showed up and especially those who didn't. We'll see you again next time, I hope. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.